Um, hi, Duncan Matthews, uh, Neighbourhood Watch in uh, northwest uh, Bristol. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. I wasn't sure whether we went or whether we should clap on off this, but thank you, it's very interesting. Um, the many questions, uh, a particular observation is that I, I understand that the number of police is reducing. There's a whole raft of questions I would like to discuss perhaps at another time as to where the remainder are going. Are they being sucked away to anti-terrorism, um, cybercrime, <coughs> and giving further pressures on the number of police that are available for day-to-day -day duties. Um, and that pressure is obviously driving um, your desire to move to a more technological approach. My concern is that that will start to operate against itself, that you're looking for greater involvement with the public, you're trying not to lose the personal touch, but if I could mention something very simple like speed cameras, nice and easy, cut and dry, takes away any problems, works all by itself, and all of us can describe their mate being done, four o'clock in the morning, going over the speed limit but no other cars around, and ending up with a feeling of being aggrieved. And I would just observe that this and solutions like that are likely to work against your two things of keeping involved with the community. Thank you. Uh, I think you make some interesting points. We may not always uh, agree. Um, but first of all, um, as far as where, where are the police officers going, well, we're going to, they are retiring and we're not going to replace them. So that's where we, we're going to have a smaller workforce. As far as speed cameras, now I, I, I start to get a bit defensive here, okay, so forgive me, I will try not to, but if you look, up, if you look speed cameras were switched on in 2003 and we had about 80, between 80 and 90 fatalities. Every year, the speed camera, every year, while the speed camera's on, those number that were killed came down. 2010, we got down to about 40, still 40 too many, I, I but... I'm sorry, Sue, to interrupt. Um, please don't get fixated on speed cameras. It was something I, you I, raised. I, I'm not, I'm not um, raising speed cameras per se. I'm just saying that here is a technological okay. solution which has blowback, unintended consequences, and if one goes to a technological solution, you're liable to find more like this. Don't, don't bother okay. to argue about no, no. speed cameras. Okay. No, I'm I, not interested I, I, in that. I'm, I'm I just understand. trying to give you an example. I understand your point. In fact, I was, listening, I was listening to BBC One last night when I think Peter Fye from Manchester, the Chief Constable, was saying that uh, the police will almost become a virtual police. And that is not what's going to happen. Okay, what is going to happen is that where technology makes us work smarter, that's what we can do. After all, my, uh, police officers are not visible when they're in their police stations playing on their, sorry, when they're working on their, <laughs> when they're working on their computers. So the more they can stay out, the more that they can have their kit with them so that they can access, um, you know, the, the, the database. That's what we will do. But I'm absolutely passionate, and I know the senior officers as well, is that we will try to safeguard as much of our local policing teams as absolutely possible. Because if we're going to continue to police by consent, it's only based on relationships. It is not based on technology. And we need to have that trust uh, going forward with our communities, and that's what we will, that's what we will promise to do in Avon and Somerset within the, uh, the, con the, the conf constructs of uh, a reducing budget. Can I just pick yep, up the issue sure. about staffing locally? Um, I, I'm not sure. Were you the gentleman who submitted the question in advance about numbers? Yeah. Was that you? No, OK. Yeah, that was Mr Matthews? Yeah. Ah, OK. Um, um, because I've, I've heard you say you've taken out X percent and uh, you're going to take out another X percent, but actually where did you start, where are you now, okay. and where are you going to be in total, and also put some numbers on the budget? Okay. Because you've talked about 46 million off, another 80 or another 34 to come. Um, What's your total budget? What was it? What is it now? What will it be? Okay. Uh, I've got that, those answers for you just for North Somerset, because I thought no, that's what you'd be most interested in. The whole area. I've got them for the uh, whole area. 
Oh, for North, for the Avon and Somerset. Yeah. Great. So between us, we can probably pull it off, can't we? You do North Somerset. Okay. So so North Somerset is actually a bit of a good news story, um, at the expense of some of your neighbours, actually, to be quite frank. Um, so. As I said, I look after the, the county of Somerset as well as North Somerset, and as part of the process that we've gone through in terms of um, relying our resources and trying to meet the demand and the pressures that we face, uh, we actually took stock of all the resources that we had available to us in Somerset and North Somerset, um, and the demand that was being faced, and all the sorts of socio-economic factors you might expect. And as a result, we discovered that actually, as you may not be surprised, that over time, uh, things change and we discovered that in some places we'd probably got rather too many police officers and PCSOs than we needed and in other places not enough. Uh, what the, that means for North Somerset actually is that North Somerset has been a net uh, benefit uh, recipient in that process. So it, since 2013, um, actually last year this happened, but since 2013 uh, with the numbers I've given, but last year um, your number of police officers in North Somerset increased by 11 and your number of PCSOs increased in North Somerset by nine. Um, that gives a budget for North Somerset for uniformed police officers and PCSOs I'm talking about now. I'm not talking about specialist detectives and other things like that because that's difficult to separate out because of the way we've centralised some of those. But for the uniformed officers that you see around, uh, that was a budget of £8.62 million pounds, um, this year, which has increased by 820000 on the year before. So you've seen a net gain of 20 uh, uniform staff in North Somerset in this last year, uh, where other areas, uh, other parts of my area, actually have seen a net reduction. So overall, North Somerset's done, done rather well. Although you, one could argue, actually, it's just got to the level it should perhaps have been at before, of course. Yeah. Plus 20, but how many? Okay. Oh, okay. Well, 200. 200, uni 200. 200 uniform police officers and PCSOs. Okay, so if I talk to you about the whole of Avon and Somerset, in 2010, we, were, we had 3,200 officers and we now have 2,689. So that's a, a, a reduction of 572 and it's an 18% reduction of officers. If we look at our PCSOs, uh, that's a similar uh, percentage decrease. So in, in 2010, we had 400 and now we've got 329. So going back to, 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 to 2010, we had a, a budget of over 300 million. We've now got 200 and 270. 270, 270 million. Where are we going to be? Well, we'll watch the space, but um, we, we, in, we anticipate that we could have 40, 50 million cut off um, for the, over the next four years. We're also very concerned that we may have to do some in-year cuts as well, uh, which will come out in July. Uh, and when 80% of your budget are people, I can't just, you just can't suddenly cut it off. Um, so we, it, it's basically, um, we'll be tackling that from reserves. So I hope that answers. That's substantial. Okay, yes. So you understand, so what we are going to be a smaller workforce, so we've got to make sure that our officers have the kit that makes them being able to uh, work as effectively as, as they can. Okay. Anyone else with a, another question? This gentleman down here. You pass it down, Mandy. Oh, Ooh, Mandy. Mandy, careful. Hi, thank you for this. Um, my name's Andrew Murray. I've come from Enbury in northwest Bristol and I run with a colleague sitting by me, uh, the neighbourhood watch scheme there. Um, can I say my previous experience of coming to these meetings is very positive before I get on to the problem. The police have always put themselves out, whether we've been at meetings in, I don't know, uh, the watch call it centre in South Mead, the Greenway Centre, whether it's been in other, over at, uh, is it uh, Brightstow School, or is it over in Shirehampton, or indeed we were invited on one occasion to Portis Head. And that was really, um, that was really good, and the police have always been very very accommodating, so I'd like to say, the uh, say thank you for that. Um, I want to raise a personal issue, not for me, but for my daughter. Um, she, had an, she, she lives in a, in a flat in Henbury, first floor flat, above um, a family who were a bit disruptive. Um, the, the boyfriend, the adult, uh, insists on playing loud music late at night. 
My, my daughter is a cabin crew on EasyJet and often has to get up first thing in the morning, could be four o'clock in the morning, to go to Bristol Airport to, um, uh, to do steward, stewarding on the um, aeroplanes. Now, I was woken up one night, I didn't manage to get down to the phone, but basically this chap had been playing up the whole time and she obviously gone down or spoken to him and expressed her concern. Uh, later that evening, he came up and tried to, and confronted her. Uh, my, my daughter's fairly strong, for both particularly mentally, and she was able to deal with him and, and really sort of more or less said that he was frightening her. Now, um, she, he left, but he did come back and he did bang on her door quite considerably, which again frightened her. She phoned the police about this and... Um, there was no response, but, ba but I think uh, probably uh, about an hour or so later, when probably she'd gone to bed and was frightened, too frightened to go open the door, there was another knock on the door. Now, um, my daughter was afraid to go to the door, but next morning she found it was the police who, in fact, had come round, somebody had come round to see her. Now, what I'm saying is this, is... You know, this is a frightening episode for anybody to deal with, particularly somebody living on their own. And particularly when you've got a situation where somebody's got to get up early in the morning, the last thing they want is this. Now, I think it has abated uh, uh, to somewhat since then. But I am concerned that, you know, my daughter's in a position <coughs> where she's frightened. Uh, she's in her own flat, with that, which actually she's buying herself. And there is no one there for her when, she's, when she needs it. You know, a card through the door is not the right solution. I would have thought somebody should have been able to get in touch with her by another means, either by text or, you know, just saying through the letterbox, it's the police here, we'd like to speak to you, something like, something like that. But instead, she, was fa she, she, she felt completely disillusioned about that. And I'd like to know, sort of, you know, what... what what the best what the best thing is to do for somebody in that situation thanks um well first of all can i apologize to you and your daughter if she's not received the service that it sounds like we'd all expect her to receive um i obviously it's difficult for me to comment about the circumstances of that particular incident without having that information in front of me um so i'd be very happy to to speak to you afterwards and, and get the details of your daughter and arrange for somebody to contact her again and talk well, about her experience a bit late now but um you know, I, th I, would, I will raise it with you afterwards. Yes, OK. Um, but certainly I'd expect that we would respond. Uh, I'd certainly expect that we would make every effort to, to contact your daughter. Uh, and equally, if that behaviour is still continuing now, I'd expect us to be uh, dealing with that for her. So if there is still some element of, of that being repeated, then there's still absolutely something we can do, even at this late stage, uh, to, to take some intervention and see what we can do. So if we can have your details afterwards, I'd be very happy talking to that one for, for you. Okay, thank you. Tom? Oh, hello there. Uh, thank you, Palitas. I'm the Neighbourhood Watch Coordinator um, in the French area, down in the French area. Um, and the question I have is one that I pose to, I think, pretty much you know, which is where are we in terms of structurally the support from Avon uh, uh, Constabulary and the Neighbourhood Watch Coordinators? and the whole structure of Neighbourhood Watch. We've got um, three um, Neighbourhood Watch administrators in the first. The support that the coordinators received about four years ago, the ring master was very extensive, uh, acting much like the World Health Organisation, informing, we could take out from the data what was happening locally, what parochially people should be looking out for as patterns change. Now that all fell away about four years ago, as you know, and I ask the administrator, well, what is the structure that is now in place? What is, what is the expected relationship? Now you've got, as you said before, you want to work smart, you want to involve everyone in the community, you've got a reduced number of staff, but you've got the potential of working with a large number of people providing information. Also, there's the element of crime prevention that goes with that. And I 
don't understand why we're not moving on this at all. You want to use a technology, the technology is there to be used. Um, but where are we structurally on this? I have no idea. It's now gone into a fog. Here, here. Okay. Um, I can't tell you how disappointed I am from those comments because uh, four years ago we were in a different position. Uh, we've put uh, a lot of resources, obviously not enough, but uh, we put a lot of resources on making sure that Neighbourhood Watch uh, felt that they were supported. Um, I know that the constabulary have been working in order to support uh, Neighbourhood Watch in, in as much as it's very important that uh, we work very closely with them, whether that's officers, whether that's PCSOs, to make sure that, that information that you are feeding, uh, you, you're getting some response. So one of the res one of the criticism used to be that it was like pouring information into a black hole and no one ever came back to us as far as that. Neighbourhood Watch um, are an absolutely vital part going forward, absolutely vital part. And uh, I will take back those comments. And obviously, they, they, they've been um, uh, agreed with, um, with, with with some of the others in the audience. And, and I will find out where we're going wrong. But we will. We have got coordinators. We have put those positions back in post. We have a neighbourhood watch um, conference, it, which is in yes, October. I think uh, is the one that we, which we, which we're having at HQ. Oh. Um, and uh, and I will, sp if, if you like to give um, Tom your details, then we will find out what's gone wrong and what is obviously still going wrong with some of the support. But I can assure you that as far as uh, investment and making sure that we have a very clear message, that neighbourhood watches and community speed watch and farm watch and horse watch are absolutely the way we, have to, we, will con we, we need to uh, look to the future. Is that I approached this with you it must have been a year ago. You said you take that, that concept back. But we really need to move beyond this position. Um, because we can't let the position stagnate. There are people employed, three people, three coordinators. You need to use the technology. You have all the information. I've written on this numerous times on how it can be done with minimal expense and it should be something that should be pushed out not just to Neighbourhood Watch but to anyone who wants to tap into it. Mm -hmm. Because Neighbourhood Watch is, I think it's about 10% of the population, it's not the whole of the population. <coughs> they should be able to tap into that information to understand locally what's happening. Because at the moment our watch gives you generic information, then we have information on the weekly summary which tells you what's happening in the egg, <coughs> mine head. But okay. in fact, you need local information. Of course you do. And it's a two-way thing. If something happens locally, you can ask those people regionally who are in the neighborhood watch or have bought into it yeah, to respond. Yeah. And now, you, why you raise, not you you raise that? You raised that with me before. Uh, and, I, and, and I will continue doing so. Uh, well, I'm delighted that you will. Uh, and I hope that you won't have to raise it because I will take that back because I thought that had been solved because I have been assured that that has been has has been sorted. That you did you weren't getting information from other parts of of the of the county. So I will take that back. And if you like to make sure that you give us your details, then I will get back to you. Okay. I can speak loudly without yeah, a microphone if you like. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not a Neighbourhood Watch coordinator, I'm just a householder, um, but I am on Neighbourhood Watch and I would just like to sort of, my experience is the opposite of yours. As a householder who gets information from Neighbourhood Watch, I feel I'm pretty well informed about local crimes in my area of North Bristol, I live in Stoke Bishop, um, and I get the information including this meeting so I'm here because I got the information that that way so I haven't seen a drop off in information that we get but I can imagine that it does appear like a black hole it's sent to our coordinator and she sends it to us and very few people respond mm. anyway that's my comment I've got a question my question is I live in Stoke Bishop in North Bristol which is fairly near quite a lot of halls of residence of Bristol University students and the main Bristol <coughs> University student crime is riding their bicycle at night with no lights. 
Now, there are quite a lot of cyclists in Bristol. Uh, quite a lot of people commute to Airbus and Rolls-Royce, and those guys do it right. They wear high-vis clothing, they wear helmets, and at night they've got really bright lights. Some even have flashing lights on during the day. You can see them from a mile away. Bristol University students seem to think it's perfectly acceptable to, to ride their bike on the main road with no lights at night wearing dark clothing. I mean, occasionally I've been able to speak <coughs> to them and say, don't do this, you idiot, because I'm going to kill you at some point. <laughs> what, what I want to know, I've never yet seen any action taken by the police. Okay, I, I don't know what you could do, um, but it seems to me it's absolutely terrible that you have people <coughs> riding bikes with no lights after sunset. I, I absolutely agree. I just, it just amazes me when you have so many near misses, when you see someone flash past you and you think, you know, there but for the grace of God, you could have knocked them over. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go to Damon in a minute as far as any operational, but let me assure you that we work very closely with students and not only students, but um, people do insist on, on driving, cycling, particularly without lights. Um, there have been some uh, specific operations in Bristol where they have been targeted cyclists, whether they are cycling without uh, lights or, um, or cycling on pavements. And I know that what we've done, and, I, and I, ha I won't have the exact figures, but something like there was, within one day, there were, there were 70 or 80 people that were given tickets. And if they then got lights, they could go down to their police station uh, at Bridewell and their ticket was then rescinded because it's all to do with education. So um, I think it's a constant. We're working very closely with um, CTC, which is a cyclist organisation in Bristol, to be able to get the message out. And you, some of you may have heard that uh, the constabulary uh, put forward, did a leaflet on cyc for cyclists uh, in a couple of, couple of weeks ago about how they need to improve their um, their safety and uh, working on the roads. But Damon, I don't know whether you want to say anything else. I can't on. speak specifically about Bristol because I don't look after Bristol, uh, but, but I, I do know, uh, as Sue has described, that my colleague there, John Riley, who's, uh, who's my uh, equivalent, um, has um, been undertaking some of those operations with his staff. Uh, you're talking to actually somebody who's a keen cyclist and who does wear, ride with his lights on during the day, um, and, and actually it is about education, I think. I mean, crikey, I was you know, 30 years ago I was stopping people for riding bikes without lights um, in North Leicestershire and giving them a bit of a hard ticking off and a bit of a telling off and, 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 and not enforcing it other than by through, through advice. But it seems to be one of those life's constants, actually, that almost you can never do enough um, ed education. Enforcement really isn't the answer. I think they like the way that the Bristol have done it in terms of actually go and get yourself some lights, present yourself at the police station, you, you won't get a fine. Um, but I think it's one of those um, those jobs we're just going to be relentless at, at, at keeping on going at, to be honest. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear that something has been done, um, but it's still a significant problem. Um, you also mentioned ticketing people who were riding on the pavement. I mean, I'm an occasional cyclist myself, and I think the main problem in Bristol is there are cycle tracks, and there are other places which are not cycle tracks, and it's not at all obvious mm. what is and what isn't. I mean, there are pavements which are labelled as cycle tracks, yeah. and there are other pavements very nearby which aren't, and I'm never quite sure whether the label's gone missing or it never was, mm. and so on. I mean, but that's an issue between yourselves and Bristol Council. Yeah. I think they're making a mess of it. <laughs> I think that, um, as you know, that um, Bristol is designated a cycling city, and so the constabulary work very closely with Bristol City Council. But you know, at the end of the day, it's all to do with tolerance, because I don't think uh, in, in, none of us are going to object to a, a young child learning to ride their bikes on pavements. What we are going to object to is someone who is speeding down and knocking some of our older people or just anybody out the way and swearing at them for how dare they get in their way. And we are so lacking in that tolerance of having to share our shared space. So um, I will take your message back and, 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 I, and I know the constabulary are working very hard with Bristol City Council to get that message out that uh, there are some areas that are just not safe. Okay. Um, uh, Tom, this you to this lady in the personal here. Okay, and then and then and then you, sir. I'd just like to pick up on what that gentleman says. I'm a keen cyclist as well, um, and I'm looking for outlets to promote and educate cyclists 
obviously the students that come into Bristol, there's a big turnover regularly. Um, I've been into the police youth cadets here and I did a talk on um, safe, you know, safe cycling basically. But that's where I'm coming from on that side, is I want to be able to be part of that educational um, programme for cyclists of all ages, not just the students. I agree, and I think, that it's, you know, I'd almost like to get back to the, God knows with what money, but almost like to get back to sort of the cycling proficiency test that we all did, um, because I think if we start young, then eventually, you know, they will, they will understand what they can do. But that's on. what I would like to be able to do, is to take it into the schools. Yeah, and, and I think that... You know, 11 years old. And there are a certain some some projects that are being done with city ca with with can local authorities who are doing that. And, and indeed, with the fire service. Yes. Um, yes so um, you know, the, the fire service actually have road safety uh, uh, as one of their own uh, priorities. Uh, and so, actually, quite often, certainly in in the counties, because because different fire service here, it's Avon in North Somerset, whereas I work with Dave and the Somerset Fire Service in the county of Somerset. Uh, but certainly as far as um, Devon and Somerset Fire Service are concerned, um, then we actually share the responsibility in many senses. So rather than both going to schools talking about the same things at different times, we'll collectively either go in together or act on each other's behalf and give the same sort of road safety messages. And you'll see PCSOs in, in our schools actually quite frequently delivering road safety advice. My, my son's school, uh, primary school, had them in only last week, talking about cycling safety and walking. Yeah, okay, this gentleman here is. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Terry Wilson. Uh, I live in the parish of Churchill and Langford. In fact, I don't know if I wrote to you about a year ago. And this again is to do with Neighbourhood Watch and the problems I've had in the area in trying to coordinate things. Now, I got up at the end of parish meeting and said, I'm the only person in the whole of Churchill and Langford who runs Neighbourhood Watch, who's the only <coughs> coordinator. Now two or three other people got up in the room and said, oh, we do as well. The reason I thought this was because you've got our watch, which is national, and then you've got the local Neighbourhood Watch as well. <coughs> and I was the only one on the national our watch team uh, who had actually registered, and I was actually on there. The others weren't. So I thought, well, you know, we need to bring this together. So I contacted um, the administration <coughs> and I said, um, can you give me the names of everybody else in Churchill and Langford because I'd like to pull all of them together. They said, oh, I can't do that. Uh, it's uh, you know, data protection. Right? <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we need to coordinate this if we're, we're going to get things together. In fact, through my own efforts, I've uh, since discovered about 11, 12, other coordinators <laughs> in Churchill and Langford, believe it or not. Um, we've actually created two or three more, and we actually now have got all those. Um, we know all their uh, email addresses and details, and I have a coordinators meeting once a quarter. There's one coming up shortly. The police have attended in the past. Unfortunately, they can't attend this time. And it means now that if anybody comes to me, I can get hold of the other coordinators and we can actually inform 250 houses just like that. And really this sort of needs bringing together a bit more than it is at the moment. And uh, uh, I would certainly urge you to do that. Um, and we also always need to remember that it is, it, it is, it is resident-led. I mean, we're there to support, which is absolutely right. We do have the Neighbourhood Watch network which um, is certainly led by Wendy Hull. Um, I think that covers mostly Bristol, though not in the, in, in the, in the more rural areas. But I think you're right. There's obviously a lot more to do, and I will take those messages back, and we will try to you know, come up with ideas. I think as far as um, uh, the constabulary is concerned, I know that they are, they are committed to Neighbourhood Watch. We're obviously not delivering for some, but not for others. We, we, we've still, we still uh, are letting some people down, and so we will have to do better. Yeah, we are getting the information, uh, which is great. And of course, being able to talk to one another at these quarterly meetings is extremely helpful because yeah. we can exchange ideas. Uh, another point, just a minor point, I'd like to bring up. We used to be able to put the signs, the neighbourhood watch signs, up on the lamppost, mm -hmm. just like that. 
now you have to go through a planning procedure to actually do it. I've now actually been waiting to put one of these signs on a lamp post now for three months, and I still haven't heard that I can do that. Who are you getting permission? Who do you have to get permission from? Uh, firstly, you have to get it from the electricity board, whoever owns the lamp post. Oh, I see, right. Uh, that came very quickly. And then I, I just go to the administrator at Fridgewater. She then contacts the local authority, and I think there has to be some form of planning permission to actually do it now. But it's been going on three months yeah, now, and I've still can't put my sign. Okay, I will take that back and see what we can do about getting that a little speedier. Thank you. Yeah, that's part of the problem with the local council. I, I know these issues well. Um, you just down to signs and the rigmarole, etc., and, and the designation of lampposts and the insurance you have to have. But what I just really wanted to ask, really from that gentleman, is who's holding the database, the full database for, for the Constantly area of neighbourhood watch? Who's actually updating it? Who's got it? I, I have no idea. Okay, I mean, it's the constabulary who will be holding the, the, the database for the, um, the neighbourhood watches. But obviously they're not going to be able to share, and I can understand the, I, I would have hoped that someone would have answered in a different way, because they could have given, you know, if you were happy to give your address, that that information could have been sent to other people to have contacted you if they were, there's different, there's different ways of, of doing that. But uh, what we've got to do is obviously try to make the process of neighbourhood watch much more effective and and in some areas, that's obviously not happening. Okay. Mandy? Thank you. Uh, Charles Kay for uh, Long Ashton. Um, we were talking about cycling, and I've now got a mental picture of the chief superintendent in Lycra. <laughs> <laughs> a picture of beauty, I'm sure you'll agree. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, <laughs> dignified uh, helmet. Um, yeah, my point is that with ever larger beats, um, the PC and PCSOs are less and less visible on the streets, and so the public or the community just don't see them as much as they used to. So it seems to me that communication has got to be the answer, and if there is more communication with leaders of the <coughs> community who are in touch with their community on a regular basis, this would benefit everybody. I agree, and uh, and I think there is a commitment from the constabulary to attend PACs um, because I think they are they are a, a really important way forward. And some parish councils don't have PACs, but where that they have, they'll have the the police that will be reporting into them. And the police won't always be able to attend every meeting. Um, that's it's just not going to be possible. But it is important that that information is being fed to the local leaders so that they can then send that out to the, to local areas. Uh, I mean, the, the bedrock of neighbourhood policing is about good communication and consultation with members of the public, and, and that is what beat officers and PCSOs join to do and what they aspire to do. And there are all sorts of things which can frustrate and prevent that, I guess, uh, not least of which are the day-to-day -day demands which cause their time uh, to be used. But I know that every one of them uh, are committed to that fundamental role of, of neighbourhood policing. They'd like nothing more. Uh, better than to be able to spend time uh, speaking to their local communities. Um, sadly, demand sometimes gets in the way of that. But um, all those people who do those roles, they're all volunteers because, frankly, they you know they're the people you want doing that role. You want people who are passionate about that job of neighbourhood policing. So I think everybody's aspiration would be to to do as you uh, describe. Absolutely. Um, I think my point was that perhaps I mean, emails uh, uh, obviously are available. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be on the phone. It doesn't have to be in person. Just an email yes. once a month, yeah, yeah. preferably more frequently, yes. but just to keep in touch. Yes. I think that's a fair point. Okay, this lady here, John. Hello. Um, my name's Heidi, and I live in Porter's Head. I've been a resident here for seven years now. And my question, I think, comes with quite a few different people's points. Um, obviously, there used to be a police station in Portugal, which is now closed. Um, and um, although we obviously have the HQ, um, and now the firearms unit is nearly ready and rearing. Um, but I think as a resident, um, and, and I'm, this leaflet, actually, when I saw it, um, did make me laugh, is that I actually couldn't nominate anybody on the sheet because I don't actually know who my beat manager is. I don't know who my PCSO is. I've never seen them. I've lived here seven years and 
I used to live on the high street. I now live up near High Down School. Mm-hmm. Um, and at no point have I ever met them. I don't know the name. Um, and I think it goes to that gentleman's um, point up there about communication. In terms of um, a, a social media is so it's so accessible now. You know, um, a Facebook page or um, an email or some some shape or form would make would mean that. Coming back to Sue's point about accessibility, um, it really needs to be done. You know, with, with Porter's Head being one of the, the largest growing cities in the in the southwest, as you said at the beginning, um, there are issues here that do happen that aren't aware of. As an instance, there's a there's an all there is actually a really quite a big undercurrent of drug problems, um, cocaine specifically. Um, I can name five parks where I have seen um, a drug deal happen. Um, and I had no one to report it to, other than, obviously, the central telephone. Um, that's one incident. Um, another incident, um, I found a stolen bicycle in my neighbour's garden. Rang up um, the local, um, the 101, I think it is. Um, and I, I explained that I was pregnant, um, but I found this bike and I was concerned. It was a really good bike, very, really, really well looked after. Um, the lady on the phone was very polite, but the, the answer was, I had to put the bike in my car and take it to Western Superman. That was the that was my local police station. Nailsy is obviously quite local, but obviously that's now up for sale and is probably going to close, which I do understand with all the cuts. Um, but I do think, you know, that that's one example. I have another example where um, uh, there was a, a bump in a car, a car accident. Um, somebody got some photos of it, wanted to report it, um, and actually had, had got some pictures of it, um, and they had to go to Western as well to submit the evidence. Um, I just think it, it, it for a, for a popular for a city that has such a large population, it just seems extreme. Mm-hmm. And I suppose when um, you're talking about funding and, and local communities coming up with ideas, one idea that I would have is um, at HQ, for instance, there's the North Gate, I think it is, that has bollards up that isn't used. And I question why that couldn't be made to be a public facing and a public ac- uh, where public could access somebody um, and somebody from HQ could staff it possibly. Um, and I wonder if that could be something that we could look at and if it would be possible. Okay. Um, well, I, I, have you ever attended the PACT meetings in Porter's Head? Okay. Because, uh, um, very, well, the, the, I mean, I've been, to, I think, to three, and they've always been attended by police officers there. In fact, the whole point of a PACT meeting is where you choose the priorities. Um, obviously, it, it's a concern that you were told to take the bike to, to Weston. I mean, you know. Um, but um, we do have a lot, quite a lot of the officers have um, they have a Twitter profile. We are they are on Facebook, and quite a lot of the neighbourhood teams. And I don't know about Porter's Head. Actually, have um, um, they actually do have um, tweet? They yeah, they tweet, and that everyone then can. That's how you access your 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 local which, officer. Which I think is valid, but I think from my point is that. Um, I think we all, we all get the local newspaper. I read the newspaper from front to back every week. Like that's, that's how I stay up to date with, with everything that's happening. Um, you know, and, and I would say I've lived here for seven years and, and I wouldn't know that I, I'm on Facebook all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a CEO of a rugby club. Um, I work for Bristol Rugby, I work for Bristol Sport. I'm very active with social media and yet I, I imagined there was a Facebook page or a Twitter, but actually I don't know what it is. Um, and actually I, I asked whether in the local paper whoever is our local policing unit, if they could just put something in there to make it so that pe- people, if I don't know about it, I'm 30, sure. you know, if I don't know about it, there's, there's, there's an awful lot of people who don't know about it. And I just ask that if it does exist, why are we not, why don't we know about it? And it certainly, it, as I said, I don't know about this particular area, but, I, but there is, if you go to the, uh, the website for the police, you will, show, you will see all the uh, people who do, all the neighbourhood teams that do, that, do tweet and or on Facebook and everything else. But I think the whole point is, is that whatever communication there is, we're not doing it well enough because the fact is that you don't know about it. Is that, so I Can think I just say, yeah, so, so um, if, if you go to our website and put in your postcode, okay. you will see who your local officer is uh, and you will be able to email them directly. Well, okay, so uh, hopefully they're up to date. <laughs> but, so, so you can give us some feedback. Um, the, the second thing is, Porter said, uh, do tweet. Uh, and I think Mandy's desperately trying to come in, or somebody's trying to come in yes, about the North Somerset portal, I suspect. Just to say that we have an antisocial behaviour and hate crime yeah. drop in um, every month from Portishead. Okay. 
and the next one is the 25th of um, June, uh, 11 till 12 at the library. So okay. that's attended by the police, a community response team, uh, and anti-social behaviour coordinator and victim support. Okay, and where, where do you have the profile? Um, that's on our council website, on our Facebook page for the council, um, on Twitter, in terms of live, there's posters as well. Okay. So the other thing that's going on uh, between us and North Somerset is that the um, jointly we won a Home Office Innovation Fund award um, to create something called the North Somerset Portal. I'm not sure if you wanted to say anything about that, Mandy, or anybody with you. Yeah, can you take a mic up there so everyone can? Tom. Before I pick up on that, if I could, Damon, um, there's also, people can go into the library because the police do regular surgeries and one of the things that we did work very closely with the police and the council work together when the police station did shut in Portishead itself, um, the police do regular surgeries in there and the library staff are also well aware and they can take messages for police staff when they're coming in as well. So we did try to make some of those arrangements and I do take your point, perhaps we should be advertising those things better, that those facilities are available. Um, the fact we had one of meeting today with police and council staff together talking about some of the um, way we were going to use that innovation fund and there is work going on across a range of areas to develop both websites develop interactive forms that make it easier for people to report things so they don't have to worry about whether it's a council issue or it's a police issue. Uh, police colleagues themselves will be setting up new systems on their websites about um, alerting communities of building on some of the issues that have been raised about neighbourhood watch and making the best of things. And we're in talks about whether we can also use that for some of the key council messages as well that will help. So um, we don't like to, you know, the way we're working between North Somerset and the police on the ground and the operational staff, we're working much more closely and the intention is that we want to make it as seamless for you as possible so it shouldn't matter who you need to go to. So Inspector Sharon Bennett works with colleagues here throughout the council, we attend regular task <coughs> meetings and share information now. It's only the start of the process and we certainly know it's not perfect but you know there's a real commitment from both organisations to improve things moving forward. Thank you. Tom, this gentleman here. Good evening. Um, I'm here to see that I've travelled all the way from the far end of the impact down in Yeovil because um, we're feeling a little unloved down there. You're not making many trips to the east, east side of the M5, but um, I came here anyway. Um, and just to contrast with uh, one of the last speakers, I have to say your Yeovil team do a brilliant job of keeping their profile up and they get an awful lot of intelligence because uh, people know who they are. We don't see much of them, they're all over the place, but, um, but we do know their names and faces, and the community does as well. Um, what I really wanted to uh, uh, pick up on was a uh, point about pushing out information, and I think this is really an operational uh, question. Uh, last year, I uh, pointed out to your team, Sue, that the uh, crime map uh, wasn't actually working for anyone in Sunset, and somebody in your office got onto it straight away, and uh, it was fixed. However, it does look as though you're using people to glue um, computers through reports to reporting up to uh, uh, the, the central systems. Uh, it's two months lag. It could be driven by near real-time data. Um, we have had, uh, the real reason I came up tonight was to talk about uh, two roads, one of which um, we had a fatal accident. When we actually finally got through to the relevant people uh, within uh, command to try and find out what had happened on this particular fatal accident on a road that had a vast number of incidents, none of which seemed to end up in any prosecution. We were told that the Freedom of Information Act fee for a fatal act report was £984. So we eventually found it through, uh, through a back door um, by passing that fee, but um, it just seemed that you've got there's something very wrong with the pushing uh, out of information that really does need to be with uh, town and parish councillors and with district councillors and with county highways departments so that um, the, uh, the corrective actions can be taken. Um, and I think that is you know, the, the symptom that I've highlighted to you. Really, these are the things which in industry would be being pushed to a website um, by the operation, uh, operational day-to-day um, uh, uh, work and there wouldn't be a person 
filtering. There wouldn't be a need to report. It would just be put there. That's where you find it. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it seems to me that that's a change you need to make if people are going to uh, know what's going on. No, I mean, I, I, it's, 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 we, we've done some major investments um, and we have a new system that will be in place um, probably at the end of this year. Um, I don't know how much we've spent, 12 million? 12 million pounds on, on yes, at least. Um, so that is that is something that we'll be working on. As far as the mapping thing, I think the, the crime map is a national thing and we feed that information in. Uh, but I will take on board the fact that it's taking two months because we, we certainly put it in much quicker than that. Um, so we will see what we can do as far as getting the, the national picture. But it is a national system that we have to feed into. If it's to work for these people, it should be next day, really. <coughs> It's not something that, that is owned by Avon uh, Somerset Constabulary, yeah. but yes, I'd like it to be next day too. Okay, the lady. Hello. Um, I live in Borset, I live in Merlin Park, and I wanted to ask you about the wind turbine on the police headquarters. Um, Merlin Park, for people who are from Portishead, they'll know, is a really beautiful park. It's used by people. Um, from all sections of the community, I live right opposite, I can see who uses the park, there's a lot of people there, teenagers, young children, parents, it's a good place to go and meet people. My concern is that the wind turbine plants seem to have put the wind turbine in the worst possible position to overlook the park and really change the nature of that as a community (coughs) spot. Um, I don't understand why the particular position of the wind turbine was chosen. And I don't know what's... There was a bit of chat earlier on in the summer about the turbine, but I don't know what the current plans are. So I wanted to ask what the current plans were, and I also wanted to extend an invitation to both of you to come to my house and have a look and see what you would think if a wind turbine was being put in a park like that okay. by you. Well, <laughs> first, I'm more than happy to, to take you up on that. The reason that uh, the wind turbine is going to be... Uh, we, we, that we've put in for, we will be putting in for a planning application is it has to be obviously adjacent and close enough to headquarters. It's it's the greatest distance from local residents, and that's obviously... But at the end of the day, it's also got to have the access to prevailing wind. So we've had a whole range of of surveys uh, to be able to capitalise on that. Um, Can I just say, though, I used to work at headquarters, so I know the layout uh, pretty well. Um, and I understand you want the position of maximum benefit. I suppose what I'm not clear about is have you looked at other positions that are slightly um, not the optimum position, but may still give you the money for saving that you need. Yeah. So because I used to work there, my husband still works there, I have a lot of friends there, I understand you need to save money, and it's not about having wind time, the turbine full stop, it's literally about that is the most imposing place it could possibly be. So I suppose I want to know if there's other options that are less imposing but could still give you what you need? Other options have been considered. We, there was a whole range of options about where to place it. And in order to be able to, as I say, to have the, the greatest amount of wind, but also to be, keep it away from the greatest number of residents, that's why it was, it's being positioned where we are going to suggest it. But it, the, the idea of putting it in for planning application now is that uh, that has to then go out to consultation. So your views will be taken on board by the, by the planners. When, when does the consultation happen? At the end of end of this month, I think it is. Okay. All right, and there will be signs up and everything as as it's, as a legal requirement. Okay. All right. Lady at the back. Hello, uh, I come from Western Superman, but I'm not asking question. But I just uh, follow up this gentleman here with the glasses and the ladies in the front about the cycle and education uh, to the school. I think that's very important if you can go to the school, a uh, secondary school, primary school, or, you know, a uh, little daughter as well. Uh, why I uh, want to do that, you would like to do that, because uh, two days ago, I drove in the morning at 30, 35 in the world school, in the main road at world school, in Western Superman, and, uh, I drove 30 miles an hour carefully, and in front of our school, uh, there is a traffic light screen, so I just passed by, and there's just, there is a girl just walk 
past the crossroad and uh, with the earplug and the iPad, of course. So that's why I was, you know, I was so frightening because that will be incident or accident this morning, on that morning. So I don't know how you can work on it, but I think that's, uh, you know, it's very important if you can give information or write information to the uh, student, any, you know, from uh, parents as well, of course, uh, because that's for prevention, you see. So I was threatening that, you know, because that's uh, make me shake and uh, I could not, you know, so until now I'm still shaking because that will be happen that morning. Uh, the other thing about cycle as well, uh, in the path, uh, you got the cycle uh, track as well. Sometimes a motorist is uh, parking on the area, on the path of the cycle path. So that's kind of things, you know, so I know you try to pretend maybe the cycle, uh, uh, what they call not abuse the people on the you know walking to the path, but sometimes the motorists as well, the, not the motorists, the people drive uh, parking on the park on the uh, track of the cycle path. So things like that, if uh, anybody can see that, it's just reported straight away. But I didn't report at that time. But maybe I will report it to the uh, community response now. I know maybe I straight away to do that. But at that time, of course, you know, I know about them, you know, but I didn't click at that time. But that's the other thing, maybe we can work on it, you know, things like that. Because and, and if you think about it, I think for those, you know, if, you, if, you're a, you. if you're a motorist or a cyclist or a pedestrian, we all will have, we'll, we'll all have evidence where, you know, near misses happen. And, uh, and as I've said before, there but for the grace of God. So I think that um, we do have to do far more on education. And that's certainly some of the things that we will be looking at uh, in, in investing. I mean, there's been certain projects where, um, where we've tried to reduce serious collisions uh, just by working with local authorities, working with cycling organizations, working with the schools. Um, and if you, just, if you just look, I mean, how often do you go past a school where people have very selfishly parked in front of a school, jeopardising their own children's safety in order so that their child doesn't have to walk more than about three yards to the, uh, to the door? Um, so that constant education is something that I know that some of the PCSOs have been out and about working with the schools um, to, to actually help to advise the parents about some of their behaviour because after all if it's the, the parents themselves who are jeopardising their children you realise that we've got a long way to go so that we can we can be um, we can park one park more considerately but also just make sure that the areas outside schools is an area that we do have to be very careful of. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is David Jolly. I'm uh, the ward councillor for the residents who live around the uh, police headquarters and we met, if you recall, when you had your consultation about the wind turbine 30th September, 30th September last year. Um, right, well this is the first I've heard that you're uh, actually going to be planning on putting a planning application in. I, I, I'm aware that um, there is a lot of anxiety uh, by local residents. And I just wonder, we've been talking about resources, um, financial resources that is. Um, you understand you had uh, pre-application advice on this wind turbine. And I think that might well have contained, although I haven't seen it, obviously because it's your document, uh, that there was an application in Clapton and Gridano of Kennel Farm that was refused for a smaller unit. Merlin Park is actually green belt. And the policies of North Somerset Council are no development or in Greenbelt or its openness. Now, uh, you, you say actually you want to put it where you want to put it uh, because of the wind. But in point of fact, actually, you could hide it amongst all the wind, ter uh, wind uh, turbines in Avon now. You could hire a bit of land and just connect straight into the grid. You'd still get the same amount of money, it just wouldn't be lighting your own lights, but it would be going into the grid and creating the money you, you want. 
Um, just, I just wonder why, in fact, you're spending money uh, looking at that site when the chances of it being approved, um, and of course the Kennel Farm uh, went to appeal and was turned down by the government inspector. Why you're wasting? Why you're using your money in that form? I, I would just add, actually, that um, permitted development rights have been uh, extended to business roofs. So you could actually use your roofs to harvest, so, harvest solar panels with, with no applications at all. Just get on with it and do uh, find that as your way of being green. And, and we, are, we are doing that. We also have biomass boilers, which we have put into place as well. Um, and we have, as a public funded organisation, we have a duty to reduce our carbon footprint which is and but you know the joys of being living in a democracy is that we apply and if it gets turned down then we don't have it so you know it will be it's, it will be open to consultation and then people can 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 put their th their views forward that's one of the joys of living where we do but i also ask uh, what whilst i just have your ear we were talking about getting close and communicating <coughs> with local communities I, I emailed your office some two weeks ago about um, <laughs> a problem we saw uh, appearing, a parking problem. I'm sorry, that's a bit mundane, but a parking problem at the top of West Hill in Portishead um, following the closure of a private car park that was used by the general public. Uh, and that was for its own reasons. Uh, and I asked actually if um, uh, some resource could be put on just to check the illegal parking for going into Tesco's and so forth could actually be stepped up. I, I wonder if uh, at some point uh, I might get a reply from Sharon Bennett, is it? Who is yeah. Sharon yeah. so is okay. Thank you. One of the things that uh, if you write to us, we will pass those letters on to uh, the constabulary because one of the things that the PCC is not operational. But uh, if, if Sharon is here, so by all means take it up with her after this. Okay, uh, Mandy, this, oh, Tom, sorry, ignoring you. I, uh, my name's Sandra Green, and I live in uh, Portishead. I haven't been here very long, but it doesn't feel very long. Um, I am very happy to hear that you are going to be including road safety as one of your um, priorities. Is that how you would term it? Um, I actually don't like the word road safety because it makes me feel that um, I'm always the one who's got to wear the armour, run faster, <laughs> wear bright colours. Whatever happens to me is going to be my fault because I haven't taken the right sort of precautions. I think a better term is road danger reduction because we're all in this. It should be the way the roads are laid out, getting rid of all these millions of um, things that we're supposed to read all in 10 seconds. And generally, the whole ethos should be road danger reduction by every single person who has any input into any way of saving lives or uh, not causing injury. Um, I hear that you've um, had a, a you've got a particular unit. Did I hear right? Um, I like the name of the officer who has been appointed to that particular unit. Uh, and I'd like to know where they're based. Um, did I understand that correctly, that there is a road operation safety? There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a superintendent who has the lead on road safety. Now, his name is Richard Corrigan, and if you give your details to Mandy, we will, we will pass on the contact details, okay? Okay, okay gentlemen. Rank? Sorry? What's his rank, Peter Corrigan? Is, is he an officer? R Richard Corrigan Richard is a Corrigan. superintendent. Superintendent. Mandy, behind you, the gentleman. Yeah, hi there. Sonna Jamal Weston, Super Mayor. I was going to raise a question tonight. I was going to listen to what Vanessa had to say, but there's a couple number of issues being raised that prompt me to put to you my, um, my question stroke issues or concerns. Um, you talk about the, the number of cuts in the number of police officers that's going to be uh, increased sort of next year and over, over the next number of years. Um, I have said I live in Western Super Mayor and uh, the council um, switch off the street lights at midnight. Um, so it's pitch dark, you can hardly see your hand in front of the place. If you're walking home from somewhere, um, it's basically the streets are very dark. 
Um, I've also heard in the media or read in the media that um, uh, money strapped council to strip um, switch off CCTV cameras, um, which is not going to make it a lot harder for the police to identify the crime um, being committed. I'm not sure if that's happening in Somerset councils yet. Um, and one of the other concerns I wanted to raise was with cars parking on um, zigzags outside schools. Um, my children go to Heron's North School. I've actually taken pictures of um, delivery vehicles and council contracted vehicles parking on zigzags on, on a zebra crossing outside my children's school. I've taken pictures and submitted to um, a number of police officers um, at Western Police Station. Um, but I don't feel enough has been done to, to, to combat the area. Not that it hasn't been an accident yet, but if one, if one occurs, should it not be deterred or stopped before it does happen? Um, so there are a few things there, weren't they? Uh, I, can't, I, can't, I, can't, I can't talk to you about council streetlights, so perhaps a council colleague can put yeah. that up in a moment. Well, no, the point is that police officers have been reduced. Yep. And there's going to be less police around. Um, CCTV cameras are going to be switched off by the council because they're already ca um, money strapped. There's, n there's so no plans to switch off any CCTV cameras in North Somerset that I'm aware mm -hmm. of. No. Um, I, no. Okay. And I think Sharon might have an answer about your school. Well, I don't know about the CCTV oh. and the lights being turned off. I know that it's having an issue with the crime series in an area, and we've used it recently in Weston, and we've yeah. had problems in series. We, we can get the lights turned back on in a certain area for a long time. If okay. It's a problem. And it does go through a careful risk assessment process and crime and disorder is one a critical element of those considerations. Right. So that's not the case. And I can confirm I've not heard anything about CCTV cameras going off. And not going by what the media yeah. so we'll see. No, not, no, not at all. No, not so much. Thank you. That's good news. And in fact, we haven't had anything as yet, touch wood, from any, any, any authority in Avon and Somerset. I think some of the stuff that I've also read about CCTV, that's been in the national, some of the, the national papers, right, okay. but not as far as I know it, anything and to do with people. So. Yeah, if I can just pick up a little bit about the schools, we do recognise that actually for communities we get a lot of feedback, both the police and the council, about inconsiderate parking and behaviour around school drop-off, etc. And some of the work that Faye has been doing with police colleagues and colleagues here is we've actually been doing a pilot with our own safety team at the council and with the PCSOs to, based on good practice elsewhere in England that we picked up through police colleagues to see if we can try and change the behaviour of parents, etc. And that's actually been very successful with Ashton School. We've got some really good feedback. So I did say a lot of the partnership work we're doing is actually some of it is about to start that process. But we are hoping and monitoring that, and we're hoping that we can extend that further. So we're really keen to hear, you know, because we know it's an issue. I mean, I live close to high down school, so I know how parents park sometimes as well. But we have, we are really seeing that as one of our priority work programmes with certainly working through the PCSOs and our own safety team. We've sometimes got little bits of money from government grants around things like cycling and so things like that. So we're trying to join it all up together to get a comprehensive approach. But it's got to be led with support from the schools themselves as well. And it's really important we don't do things to people, that we actually work with them and say, we've got a problem, we're getting lots of complaints as public bodies. How can we work with you and your parents to really make change? So, and my other point is, if you've seen a council contractor who's part illegally, please let me know because we will follow up. Yeah, yeah, follow up, we'll give you that afterwards, thank you. For the joys of uh, Gordana's school, we have, um, they partially fund a PCSO, so, uh, I drive past here every uh, most days, and and there is uh, quite often dawn. Uh, is, the, the PCSO is is here, and she's working with parents and with some of the sixth formers who park their cars uh, sometimes a little bit inconsiderately. And I know that she's working very hard in in this particular area. The gentleman here. Hi, um, Lars from Dundry. I just have a brief question for him. You mentioned earlier on that we have 20 more uh, PCs and PCSOs in North Somerset. Is that correct? 11 extra police officers and 9 extra PCSOs. Yes. Well, I've been at the London Parish Council for the past uh, seven years. And in this time, I've seen the workload of our police officers increase quite a lot. The area they have to cover has more than doubled. And that coincides with what um, Charles said, <coughs> that they can show less presence at parish council meetings or local events. So how will these 20 extra officers, how will they be deployed throughout your Somerset? Okay, so uh, they're, they're, they're deployed as uniformed staff 
who are conducting a, a, a mixture of response duties, so responding to 999 calls and calls to the, the non-emergency number, and also uh, who are neighbourhood staff and are engaged in local communities actually working a beat. Uh, Sharon or Stuart might want to give you a little bit more information about how they've been deployed locally. Will the feeds reduce again? Because they've been increased over the years. Okay, the Stuart can deal with that because he was the architect for me. Oh, right. I'll say for me because I won't let him take all the blame. <laughs> Sorry, who's got the mic at the moment? Do you want Stuart? <laughs> Um, the two issues there, in relation to the beach, obviously the size of North Somerset hasn't changed. Um, the beach structure is very much an internal um, organism that has grown over the years. Um, more or less to, for our own um, structures and our own management to make sure that we have got uh, defined geographic areas split up. Um, recently, the Boundaries Commission from Her Majesty's Government came down and actually moved some of the ward boundaries in North Somerset, and in response to that, um, we have changed some of the boundaries and reduced the numbers of beats within North Somerset. Now, that's not there's been a reduction in the number of beat staff, because the number of beat staff has stayed the same, but the actual structures that we have generated ourselves have actually reduced. Now, one of the key reasons for that is if you go onto our website, previously in Somerset we had 199 beats, which meant we had 199 beat pages with 199 updates, which was actually taking the staff off the street for quite a long time. We've actually restructured some set from 199 beats to 52. Now that is an internal system for us, but reducing the bureaucracy internally is getting our staff back out onto the street quicker, uh, while still maintaining the same presence in the parish councils in the areas, because we're still in North Somerset, not reducing the number of beach staff actually working on your areas and, and, and your your local parishes. Um, in relation to the increase in staff, there's been an increase in the number of response officers working from both Nailsey and from Western Supermare, and that is very much to, to meet the, de the increased demand that's coming into North Somerset. Um, as Damon and Sue were mentioning, it's not so much the demand from crime, but the demand coming in from people who are vulnerable, missing persons, um, and assisting other services in, in, in their delivery of what is the responsibility. So we've had to increase um, the, the number of officers available on the patrol teams. On the neighbourhood side, the increase with the, the PCSOs has been an increase. It has been concentrated around the, the urban areas, because that is where our, our greatest demand comes from. But that spread, that increase has been spread across the whole of North Somerset. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone who's not asked a question before I uh, talk. Thank you. My name is Bill Sells. I'm in Yatton. Um, I'm involved with the Naval Watch there, but my question is really about motorcycling, which I'm a, a fan of. Um, a few years back, North Somerset used to run a ride to arrive event at the headquarters, which meant that uh, guys like me could be told how to, or could be taught how to ride motorcycles better and more safely. Does that still happen? And my second question is, um, do you think it's appropriate to show a greater presence at things like the Western Bike Night on a Thursday evening during the summer, where there are probably up to a thousand motorcyclists who meet on the, uh, on the seafront and would welcome perhaps some uh, interface with police? Thank you. Okay. Well, we still run Bike Safe, where we, because uh, we, I've attended that's that's why I know where uh, a, a group of um, motorbikers uh, come and 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 then they they do, I think they do theory for so many hours and then they go out on their bikes and there's a motorcyclist a police motorcyclist behind them and they go back and they talk about the things how to improve. Um, I think one of the one of the concerns I have is just how many fatalities have been recently caused by it, uh, motorcyclists. Um, uh, of a certain age, I think, but I could pro probably say, um, and 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 we do have to be very aware of that. And it's something that the Triforce we're in a tri in a Triforce <coughs> arrangement with Wiltshire and Gloucestershire, and I know that they are looking very carefully about how we can do more um, education, because it's not to do with enforcement. Because once you're dead, you're dead. Uh, what we've got to do is educate 
to be able to to ride more sensibly and not think that the the the, the road is just open to everyone. Um, mm. But there is far too often I get this uh, email every morning as well, and particularly over after sunny weekends, I have to say that there is invariably a a, a motorcyclist that has been killed um, on on our roads, and there are certain roads that must be fun for motorcyclists. Um, and, and, and those are obviously the hot spots that the police are targeting. Okay. In relation to the, the, um, the Western Superbear, uh, the, the bike needs, we get range ready for our triforce motorcyclists to come down and engage with them. Um, and so, they, again, around education, um, engagement, um, and yeah, it's, it's fully supported, we're aware of the dates. Thank you. Thank you. David. Thanks. I'd just like to ask a question, Sue, about CCTV scenes that were raised earlier. Uh, obviously, the local authorities fund and supply CCTV. Uh, I'd just like to know from the police uh, how important is it uh, to work uh, to, to the police um, uh, police ability to track down and, uh, and catch criminals and prosecute? Um, so it's, it's very important, and actually, um Whilst there haven't been of late um, a any conversations about the removal of CCTV, uh, which is largely provided by local authorities, there have been some in the past, and I have been involved in some. Um, and um, I spoke to a, a particular council scrutiny committee, um, which will remain nameless, um, about the use of CCTV and, and their request for the police to make uh, a financial, direct financial contribution to the running of the scheme. Um, and uh, and my, my comments to them and the evidence that I presented to them was actually the police already make an equal and opposite contribution to local authorities. So we both have a responsibility, local authorities and the police, a statutory responsibility to reduce crime and disorder. Uh, historically, what that has looked like is that local authorities have provided the CCTV cameras and the infrastructure and the monitoring and the police have dealt with the evidence that has been presented by the local authority. And the work I did in this particular local authority actually was pretty much that we were at parity, actually, in terms of the contribution, the direct financial contribution that the local authority were making to provide the CCTV infrastructure was uh, equally matched by the cost to policing and the prosecution system in terms of actually dealing with those offences that which um, were um, identified and taking them through uh, to uh, successful prosecutions. But it's an absolutely vital tool for both local authorities and the police and indeed the public because um, uh, you know, in, the, in the years that uh, CCTV has been operating uh, across the country, I think we've seen huge success. Um, last night um, at Minehead at the Neighbourhood Watch meeting, there was uh, a, a couple of the volunteers uh, who run Minehead CCTV. So Minehead is a, a system which is funded by the local authority but operated in terms of monitoring by entirely by volunteers, um, some of whom uh, I've had the pleasure of awarding certificates to for doing more than 2,000 hours worth of monitoring. And when you consider these are people in their 60s and 70s, they're up until 3 in the morning, um, watching some people uh, walk around Minehead uh, barely dressed uh, and often inebriated, uh, they do a tremendous job. So actually th there's a great partnership I think between local authorities, the police and indeed the public in many cases uh, and CCTV has been hugely valuable I think to us all in that sense. Tom. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is David Owens. I'm one of the two ward councillors for East Ward in Portishead. A um, couple of things I'd like to say. Uh, first of all, um, you said about <coughs> uh, the maximum number of people out on the beat on patrol, which is great. But I do hope that the people that uh, actually operate 101 are regarded as frontline staff. Because I do know that when you do um, contact them on 101, and I had to do that uh, yesterday uh, on behalf of a resident, um, you have to wait a very long time, and I just wonder whether people ring this number and then unfortunately just put the phone down and say, well, forget it. Um, I have to say that when I have got through to 101, and in the case yesterday, the response was absolutely superb. We had a PCSO straight over from Nailsey who attempted a particular problem in Battery Lane in Portishead, not actually my ward, but 
nevertheless, it was a neighbour who, uh, who had called me. Um, so I do hope that uh, the 101 service <laughs> is well staffed and it would be great if uh, we could cut down on the time that it takes to actually answer the phone. I do appreciate the problems of course with finance, etc. Second thing I'd like to say is um, it's a little bit of antisocial behaviour but um, not what uh, most people would expect. It actually involves drivers and it actually involves the resident of um, Brunel Court uh, opposite the library in Porter's Head and uh, a lady arrived at surgery and mentioned about the um, disabled parking just outside the library um, and how it was always full of uh, cars that weren't actually uh, being driven by disabled or were very disabled people. Um, my colleague and I, actually David Pasley and I, went down and had a look and there were seven spaces, six of them were taken up with cars, one was empty, uh, six cars, not one of them, were um, being driven by disabled. They weren't showing a blue badge, so I assume they were just um, taking pop up. And if you've got PCSOs around the area, I think a mention to, uh, or even a photograph, I know you can contact the drivers, uh, it would make a big difference because those particular spaces are used by, by, by disabled people that are visiting people in um, Brunel Court. And of course a lot of the people in Brunel Court are on their own. They welcome visitors, but if the parking spaces are not available, it's quite likely that uh, disabled friends will say, well, we just can't make it. So that's something which uh, I would really like to be seen done. One last thing I'd like to say, nothing's been said tonight about the uh, police cadets, which I think is an excellent idea. Uh, and I do wonder whether the police cadets could actually provide a bridge between the local youngsters and the police, and whether we've been talking an awful lot about communication tonight, um, whether that particular arrangement would lead to um, better communication right through the age range in Porter's Head. Thank you. I think uh, as far as the cadets are concerned, I think they're an absolute valuable uh, resource. I think people love seeing them out and about because they, 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 they're looking extremely smart. I've, I, I spend a lot of time listening to, to the police cadets and I think that communication is, is absolutely invaluable and I think we can build on that. Uh, as far as the delays on 101, I, I acknowledge that people are having to wait too long the upside is when you actually do get through, uh, when we've, we've monitored the um, satisfaction, we, go, we get really high. But of course, if you get delayed, we're going to have some abandoned calls and it's something that we are monitoring very carefully. I think if you look at looking at some of our persistent callers, if you think about it, we have 100,000 calls made by 30 individuals a year. Okay, so you can understand why the constabulary are doing a lot of work with helping those who are mentally ill, who are very vulnerable, who may be lonely, who, who you know, for, for all the right reasons need somebody, but it shouldn't be 101. So we need to work that through, and I know that just um, the constabulary have just put forward a toolkit which they're now working with their neighbourhood policing teams to do that. Um, because uh, if we can reduce those and there have been some fantastic results already that by putting certain individuals in touch with other organizations that it's not the 101 um, but reducing that we can we can provide a better service um, but I'm absolutely passionate and I know the senior officers are absolutely passionate that we need that we we know it, we're not good enough on 101 and we will continue to to, to do what we can um, because that that accessibility is absolutely key but I I monitor it my, my team monitor it we, we uh, and we monitor it particularly by abandoned calls because that's when people have given up and we need to be much better <coughs> because what happens at the moment is that you get the phone relatively quickly answered and then you get triaged as it were and what we're not doing well enough is managing expectations and what we need to get better at is saying have you thought about other ways of doing it but also that you are 
what I'd like to have a, a system that maybe that says you're fifth in the queue and then you're fourth in the queue. I mean, you know, we, 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 what I don't want is ever have those ghastly messages you sometimes have with call centres, like your call is really important to us, <laughs> and, and you think, sod off, your our call can't be that important. Cause you haven't, but we, we, we are putting more and more people on to, uh, into the, into the, um, the, the, the full service centre. Um, but we are expecting more and more from our full service centre because they are doing a, a lot more work. So I think what we're doing is right because we are getting better satisfaction, but I totally accept that we need to do uh, more in order to reduce that weight. Okay. Do you mind if I leave? No. I've really got to get going. No, no, I've, I've, I mean, I've, I've promised. Oh, we've only got another couple of minutes. So um, has anyone got a, a, a question that we will do publicly? And then if you want to talk to us later. Is anyone who hasn't asked us a, a question here? Um, this lady in the, um, the pink. My name is Anne Times, and I live in Portishead. I would like to pass my thanks on via this uh, uh, forum to a police officer that uh, um, came to our assistance when there was an incident at Portishead Golf Course. His name, I didn't know what his rank was, but his name was uh, David Wheatram, and he was extremely professional. Um, he listened, he handled the situation extremely well, and he handled us very well, I was with a colleague of mine, and I have to say that um, I was extremely impressed with the level of um, you know, professionalism that's coming from the, he was only a young, young, young police officer, he must have only been in 20, something like that. And I wanted to make sure that you knew, and everyone here knew, about the, the help that I got from that police officer, who was excellent. Thank you very much, that's lovely to hear. And I, I recognise that there's somebody's recognised the name back there. I don't know Dave personally, but Sharon clearly does. So we'll make sure that message gets back to him. Thank you very much for taking the time to share that. Okay. Right, I promised that this meeting would close at nine, and th I'm really grateful for you to have, have given us so, so many questions. We'll be staying around for a bit, so if you want to ask, ask us uh, individual questions, then, then please uh, feel free to do so. But I hope that the whole point of this meeting was to show that we are accessible and that we are open to questions and, that, and we will learn. And there's a lot of things that we will learn from tonight and that we will make sure that the uh, working with the police and our, and our other partners, that we will make sure that uh, we try to provide a better service. But the whole point of these meetings was that we listened to you and I hope that tonight that you will accept that we have listened to you. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>